<laughs> moin moin Liebeck. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I am coming as um, introduced from Lausanne. We have uh, an office in this uh, wonderful building. Um, and you are all welcome to visit at any time. Um, so we have a lab that's in the computer science, but also has postdocs from the learning sciences, which is uh, my own background. And we do robotics, uh, social robotics. We do um, uh, vocational training, Berufsbildung, um, online learning, MOOCs, and so on. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about technology today, but I want to set the stage by you know, showing you where I'm coming from. Because I know that in learning there are lots of different approaches, there's lots of different learning. When you're learning how to drive a car, it's different from when you learn about political science, or should be. Um, so this could be a, a talk, you know, but these are just some keywords that you know, make me interested. You know, if we want to, students to learn complex things, we want them to connect it to their own experiences. We want them to exchange viewpoints. We want them to have authentic roles. Um, we might use interaction scripts to um, give people roles or to give people ways of interacting that we think are more productive than just sit in a group and discuss for one hour. Um, we are often in situations that switch between synchronous and asynchronous. Um, especially uh, in the in the virtuelle Fachhochschule. I think this is a common challenge. How do we bridge this uh, transition? We want collaborative learning, but we also know that a lot of valuable learning happens individually. How do we go from one to the other? When should we go from one to the other? Who should you be working with? Um, we want students to create rich content, but also work with rich content that exists, um, to have rich interactions with different kinds of interfaces, to use multiple representations. This is one of the things we know from learning sciences that's very powerful. Um, to have interfaces that really help them learn. We might put them in groups, de depending on, on our, our pedagogical uh, roles. And in our lab, we talk about teacher orchestration, which is really teaching. But you know, you can, teacher scripting is when you sit at home and you say, I want them to do this and this, and I have this idea behind it. And then you come into the classroom, or you log on and the VLAN is gone. Or there's a fire truck driving past the window, and, or the, there's, a, there's a football VM going on on laptops. So how do we real time understand what is happening, whether you guys are paying attention or are falling asleep, how I can adapt my teaching, or how I can support your group and individual processes. Um, so these are all kinds of the challenges that we're interested in. And there, there's a, a recent blog post that I thought was, was quite nice. Um, you know, this, this idea about what is the relationship between pedagogy and technology. And the point that's made in this blog post is that you can't just say, okay, let's first figure out the learning theory and then discuss what technology we need because technology gives us new opportunities. Um, it's, it's like, you know, when Henry Ford asked people what they wanted, they said a faster horse. They didn't ask for a car. Um, so if we ask, so we should ask teachers, we should ask students what they need, but we cannot limit ourselves to saying we want Moodle with less buttons or a nicer interface. Um, new technology gives us new opportunities and there has to be a back and forth between those two, which is why a computer science lab with you know, uh, learning science researchers or collaborations between different uh, areas is very important. Um, this is a really interesting uh, series of books that was actually uh, recommended to me by a, a, a teacher in, in Switzerland because I was asking, you know, I'm from mostly focused on university level and from a pedagogical background. What do teachers in schools think of when they talk about collaboration scripts? And so I found it very interesting to read this because there's a lot of the things that we talk about theoretically are here explained in very practical terms. How do you get students to sit together in a group of four, have a big piece of paper, you write something, I write something, and we rotate it, and now I see what you wrote. This is a form of orchestration of scripting. It's wonderful. Um, but this is not, shouldn't be just limited to primary school. I mean, why don't, you know, we do bar camps because we as adults think that this is a way that's maybe more productive for us than what we're doing right now. Um, the problem becomes when we're in a lecture with 300 people or when we're online and we're using Adobe Connect or we're using a forum and we say, well, yeah, we can't do any of that. Um, my kind of leading question is how can we enable these kinds of rich learning in the context where we exist? So my own background, I did a PhD in University of Toronto 
And uh, we were looking at taking a teacher uh, preparation course from 25 students to 80 students. And that's not massive, but it's still, as you know, uh, qualitatively different. And we wanted to maintain the kind of project work, presentation, small group work that had been in the seminar style class at a larger scale. And back then, you know, I kind of cobbled together with duct tape some of these Web 2.0 tools that you know, Google Docs, um, Etherpad, a wiki. I wrote some Python scripts that took some API and sent something from one place to another. But these were, you know, write once, use once scripts that you run them once in the middle of the class and you hope it works. And of course, 99% of teachers would never be interested in doing something like that. Um, my second study in my PhD was a MOOC for teachers. So we, wanted, uh, so we ran a MOOC on edX. Uh, we had about 8,000 registered and about 2,000 active teachers in schools, mostly. Um, and we wanted them to uh, experience how technology can make uh, pedagogy more rich. And so if we want to do that, we need to ourselves change the way we teach. We can't show a bunch of videos about rich learning. And so we had a challenge with interface because edX is very limited, um, like most learning management systems. So we added a lot of technology so that, for example, we could crowdsource on the one hand, all right, what can you do with 2,000 teachers that you can't do with 20? Um, well, you can ask them to input a useful resource. You can ask them to uh, rank, review, comment. And this takes five, 10 minutes. But the result is a database of 2,000 resources tagged. You know, you can have word clouds, you can have all these things that are then useful to students, okay? So that's kind of what you can do because of scale. But then we also want to do things despite of scale. Even though we have 2,000 people, we want to enable those small groups with really intense collaboration, not just superficial retweeting and, and, and sharing. And so we designed a, a kind of a collaborative interface with some instructions. Uh, we used Etherpad, we had a wiki, we had a chat on the side, we had different kinds of things. I'm not gonna go into details here. But the problem for me at the end of this was really frustrating is that all the work we put into this in terms of technology is not reusable, right? It's on GitHub, it's open source, all of that stuff, but it's one specific course design embodied in code. It'd be very difficult to reuse. Um, now, all of the pedagogical things that we learned from this, um, which are in my thesis and in publications, I think will be useful. But the problem is, I mean, you could read that and say, I want to do this, and you can't do it, right? This is kind of the unique challenge. If you were a primary school teacher, you read something and say, I want to try that tomorrow, right? Online, at large scale, we have limitations. So at the same time, I came across a book written by Pierre Dillenburg, who is now my boss, um, about modeling scalable education. And he came up with this uh, notation, it's almost like a musical score, for representing collaborative scripts. So you have these three levels, individual work, because as I said, individual learning, individual work is still very important, group work, and here we could define the groups in many different ways, and the whole class. And you have a timeline, because time passes, um, especially if we're doing something at the same time, but even if we're not, then there might be dependencies, I can't do something before you finished it. And here's a, here's a script that he actually published 15 years ago. It's, it's quite well known in the CSCL literature, Computer Supported Collaborative Learning, where you say, okay, I want someone to discuss a, con a, a contentious issue. Um, and if I just put them together, they might just agree with each other, right? There's a lot of group think, there's a lot of the intellectual laziness. So I want to group people who are really opposed to each other. I think that's going to spark a more interesting discussion. So I'm first going to ask them what they think about this issue. And then I'm going to ask them across two dimensions. So if you're uh, in favor of, you know, uh, drugs being allowed in sports, or if you're against, you might be against because it's unfair or because it's bad for health. So those are two dimensions. Now we're making this problem a bit more complex, and we can use those questions, like a personality survey, to put people on a two-dimensional scale. Very simple stuff. But now we can calculate the pairs that have the largest distance, and we can put them in groups. And now we can say, here's what Peter said, here's what John said. Now you have to agree on a common answer, even though you really disagree. And so from experience, you then get much more rich discussions. And as well, the teacher gets data where he can see how people shifted that he can use to facilitate a debrief. So as I said, this is nothing new. This was documented 15 years ago. Um, but this was kind of our inspiration to say, can we make a, a platform where a teacher could say, I want to do this, but actually I want to do it a little bit differently. I want them to watch videos. And I want them to write a text together. And I want them, 
you know, and they could actually be able to do that. So here's an example, and this is the first time you're seeing Frog, which is um, the platform that we're developing. And you don't have to read all this, I'll show you a little demonstration. The idea is, what if we wanted our students to talk about the influence of Uber on city, city development, right? It's a very complex issue. What should cities do about Uber and, like, and similar companies, or Airbnb? Um, so we give them four roles, right? Jigsaw script, you're the mayor, you're a taxi driver, you're a, a customer, and you are a, a, a Uber driver. And we give you four different articles to read from different viewpoints. And then we put you together first in expert groups, all the mayors from the different groups, you know, say what should mayors do, what have mayors done in different cities. And all the taxi drivers, ah, this is how we can fight them. But then you mix the groups. So this is what it could look like. Um, you have here three students and a teacher. The teacher goes into the management interface, he configures the graph, adds some activities, we'll get back to this later. He then is ready to start the graph. The three students are logged in and the teacher starts the graph. Here you see there's two different groups because we only have three students. So these guys are seeing the same article. This guy is seeing a different article. They have a little chat interface where they can talk. We have some semantic dashboards that are different for different activities. They now, these guys are in the same group because we switch grouping. They're now brainstorming some ideas, voting up and down. We have some other dashboards up there. They can, you see that these are, are rich activities that are live synchronized. And we now switch to a third interface, which is kind of a visual interface where we, let's, where we can, as a whole class, coordinate. You know, here we have um, four quadrants. We could also have a background image where we have people uh, move ideas. The teacher wants to talk because maybe it's a live class, so he pauses the class, he restarts it, gets their attention, um, and so on. So this was actually done almost a year ago, and we've come a long way from there. But I still like this video because I don't know what you saw. What I hope you saw is configurable, live, synced, collaborative activities, not just one, but many, a complex social structure, so not just groups, but groups and roles, a flow of data, not just between different groupings, but also between different activity types. And this is fairly rare. Uh, semantically meaningful dashboards, they might not be the prettiest or, or the, the, the most intelligent, but it's the, the structure is there to have intelligent information, whether you are doing a chat, you're doing a quiz, you're doing um, uh, you know, different kinds of activities, you want different data, not just how many people have dropped off. And you see some live orchestration action. So the teacher, not because teachers, I think, are very afraid of losing control. Okay, now they're in front of their laptops. A, I don't know what they're doing. B, they don't want to listen to me. I have to jump in and scream to there to get their attention. Here, you still have control. Um, so let's look at Frog today. So this is Frog. And um, we'll start with activities. So we have here a bunch of different activities. These are all plugins. These are all, um, so the idea here is to build an ecosystem that many people can contribute to. Um, you should, the goal is that if you want to make a collaborative activi learning activity, this should be the fastest way because we're taking all the hard stuff, the logging, the social structure, the logging in, the dashboards, and we're abstracting that. We're letting you work on the actual activity. So what do we have? Well, we could have people write a little software program. Maybe they need to write it in Python or maybe in JavaScript. And of course, we can have some automated tests and we can have the students run those tests while they're changing the code to see if it's working. Um, and we have a dashboard. So we can see as the students are going through um, how they're doing. Um, of course, we have a chat. We, but we also have, um, you know, we can have a robot or we can look at how it looks with some messages. Well, it's more fun if we have two students, so let me get, add another student, and that's how it looks with two students. Um, again, we have a dashboard. It's a simple word cloud right now. Um, we have, um, so we have some gener generic kind of content communication kind of activities, right? Um, we also have some very specific activities. Uh, we have, we're well, maybe the le only learning management system or whatever you want to call us, that has an activity for booking train tickets. Okay, this is revolutionary. Now, why would we want that? Okay, this, this look a bit bad at, at, at a short resolution, but here, for example, there's four different interfaces for ordering train tickets. 
Um, the reason for this is because we were using it in a visual computing class. And the teacher, this is 140 people in a large lecture, the teacher wanted them to experience the theories. So we embedded this, and he, every student had to buy three train tickets using all the four interfaces, and then vote on which one they liked the best. And then, of course, we grouped them based on opposite opinions. We grouped them across the classroom, and we had them chat. And now they had to rank and come up with one answer. And we were very curious how this would work, whether students would actually be willing to chat with someone across the classroom. Uh, now, these are computer science students. It might not work with everyone. Um, it was amazing. It was completely quiet, and you just hear all this ticky tacking, right? Where usually they're sitting there for two hours. You know, um, some of them are actually trading Bitcoin, because I sometimes walk in the back of the room. Uh, some of them are watching videos. They were totally engaged. Um, then, of course, we get statistics about how many errors they're doing, um, you know, and of course, how, how much uh, they're changing their opinions. We have a progress dashboard that show us uh, how soon they're finished. And so the idea is not only, so this is a very specialized activity, the next time we'll use it is in one year when that course runs again. But because it's part of Frog, we could put it into a graph that had all of these other communication um, activities. I'll just show you one more and then we'll go. Uh, so we have a quiz, of course. Um, so we could have a statistics quiz. This is from um, a lecture with 300 students where we do statistics and we're trying to use discovery learning to where people have to invent box plot. They've never seen that before, here or whisker plot. Um, so we have a quiz here, but we can also have rich text and media, right? We can have different kinds of things in the quiz. And then when you're in a large lecture, you really want to know when people are going to finish. It's 300 people, you need to do a debriefing. And after 10 minutes, you see 70% are done, 30% are not yet done. So do you skip? Do you wait? Are they, are they almost done or have they given up? So we have here, this is data from the visual computing class that I just described. Okay. And the blue line is average progress of the class through an activity. The red line is the percentage of the class that finished. So when the red line reaches 100%, everyone's done. Um, actually, when the blue line reaches 100%, everyone's done too, but they, they tell two different things. So this is the final result, that's fine. But what happens when we actually re do, a, do a little replay, like in sports? All right, so starting, you see that there's the average progress going up, but not a single person has finished. Okay. Now, what are these stippled lines? These are predictions. So we dynamically try to predict um, when people will finish. Now, these are very simple predictions, and you see that they're, they're changing. So, I mean, uh, at a certain point, we get better and better information. But we have a master's student who spent the whole semester now, because we have this data and because we have this interface where he can try out new visualization, new algorithms, we can now keep improving this. And the nice thing is, once he has a good one, it's in Frog for everyone to use. It's not just a, a weird research project. So, we have these activities. Um, but individual activities is nothing new, although I think some of these are, are very nice. So the nice thing is when you start connecting them. Um, and to do that, we have operators. So operators, deal, they're kind of like functions. They deal with data. They can either take student data and do something with it. It can send it to different people. It can take data from outside, right? So let's do an example of that. So I'm going to say I want to get an RSS feed. Let's see, which RSS feed should I choose? How about this one? So now I'm curious, is this going to work? Because I don't want to start my class and I, I, I made a typo and now everyone's sitting there. So I can preview. So some of you might have heard about this. Uh, now this is just the, the thumbnail view. Of course, we can make it bigger. And of course, we can... Why is it Yeah. So, great. Now we know that we can get, um, get data. We can get Twitter feeds. We can get all kinds of things. Um, now let's try to actually run a script. Here's a little bit of a more complex script that I did. What's, what's going on here, I'm not going to go through everything, but these three guys are getting different kinds of content. So let's get some tweets that have uh, hashtag OER. All right. Um, let's get... Uh, have you guys known about Hypothesis? It's a really nice tool um, that lets you annotate any web page. 
And there's a lot of educators who start using it with their students. And because it's an open standard, it has really nice APIs. So the question is, okay, you let them annotate. That's a nice active learning strategy. What do you do with all that data that they generate? Can you bring it in and then have students work with that data? Um, yes. Uh, and then we'll get some different RSS feeds. And then we're going to put it into this operator, which distributes it to different students so that they all get a random mix of these. And then we'll have a few different activities. And let's see if, how this works. So I'm going to start the graph. And, um, you know, it'll be much more interesting to have uh, these interactive activities if we could um, work with someone else. And now I'm very curious whether this will work or not. Oh, there we go. <laughs> So I um, have a little bit of help to demonstrate. So I mean, this is one way of interacting, right? And this is pretty cool already. However, wouldn't it be nicer if we could um, actually talk to him? So now this is going to take a while because now it has to go and fetch all those things that I just showed you. So you see, it's now soon going to turn all green. There we go. And let's see if this works. Hi, Espen. Hi, can you hear me? Where are you right now, Espen? I'm in Norway, in my office. Okay, well, let's uh, do a little bit of knowledge building around open educational resources, shall we? Um, sure. So, I find this one really interesting. What do you think about that? Do you see anything interesting on, on the topics that you got assigned? Oh, that's interesting. Let me look at this one. Oh, that's all they actually annotated, so there's nothing to click. Okay, well, let's try a different activity. So I thought we'd, we'd use this, this background image. We could try to kind of organize our ideas here. Um, so for example, this one, let's see. I feel like this should go find an access perhaps. Okay, that's an interesting one you have there. Good, now let's move on. So let's, let's write a little um, thing about OER. Well, I think it's great, what do you think? Yes. <laughs> okay. See, this is why we group people based on op opposed opinions. This is a perfect example. Um, so given that this example isn't very pedagogically useful, we'll go on. Now, Espen, um, I want you to kind of summarize what you see there. So if you can just add one idea to promote OER, and you can add any kind of evidence that you want, um, and then we'll, we'll keep that. So my idea is go to more bar camps. And let's see, this is probably good evidence of that. But you know, I want to, let's see. Let me edit this a bit more. What if we, like, you do a calculation. So if we say, you know, students in Schleswig Holstein, I read somewhere 92,600. Let's say they can save by OER, let's say 20 euro per person. What would that be? Let's say B1 times B2. Yeah, but what if it was 30 euro? Okay, that looks good. Um, so I'll add that as evidence. Um, okay, so I think we'll, we'll publish this. Are you done, Aspen? Yeah. Okay, so that was actually the end of our uh, very uh, quick OER uh, lecture. Now, you know, this was a live lecture, so you saw that we took in a bunch of content from the web, from um, great uh, sources. And we generated some content. What happens to that content? We uh, automatically posted it to a WordPress blog. So that's Espen's contribution. And there's mine, as you see. Um, you can go look at my spreadsheet. Or you can listen to another great podcast. Who are you writing? Uh, some, someone made that. I don't know who. They're, they're probably not here. Thank you, Espen. So to me, one of the exciting possibilities with FROG is to begin to bridge the gap between research and practice. For example, in the field of computer-supported collaborative learning, we have a long tradition of coming up with innovative new interfaces to support student collaboration. Several years ago, I read a paper about an innovative new application for chat, where you could have threaded discussions and you could even point to a place on a picture and say, this is what I'm thinking of, and the other student could click on your chat message and see exactly what you were pointing at.
The problem is, if you said, I'm teaching an online course tomorrow, I'd like to use that chat activity, generally, it was never published, or if it was published, it was never maintained, it's very difficult to integrate, and so all of these great papers don't actually turn into very large uh, improvements in teaching practice. Similarly, you've got a bunch of conferences around educational data mining, AI in education, learning analytics, where people are presenting new kinds of visualizations, uh, different algorithms uh, for clustering semantic data. On the left here, you see a bunch of different published papers, all discussing how to intelligently uh, group students. But again, if you say, I'm teaching a course next week, I have an online forum, I would like to see visualizations of the students' uh, topics semantically extracted, or I would like predictions of which students are struggling, which groups are working well, it would be very difficult. One of the great things about Frog is that once you have an algorithm, developing the algorithm itself might be hard. It should only take a few lines of code to take the algorithm and integrate it into Frog. And once you have it there, you can use it for multiple purposes. So on the one hand, you can have a very intelligent visualizations, dashboards, and live feedback to the teacher, or even to individual students or groups of students. But you could also use it to re redistribute student data. So we could find two students who, or two groups that provided very different points of view, and we could send the answer from one group to another group. Or we could take the students from one group, split them, and join them with students from another group. Or we can even adapt the activities so that one student uh, sees a video, another student sees a PDF, sees an interactive simulation, and so on. Here are some examples of research that's currently ongoing in our lab. So I showed you a very simple word cloud uh, dashboard for the chat, but we're working on much more in, uh, intelligent semantic analysis. Here's an example of uh, trying to extract topic clusters from uh, forum messages in an online course. Now, if you look at topic two, chocolate, iron, chip, glass, in general, wouldn't have much to do with each other, but because this particular uh, lesson was about a specific um, experiment, these are actually um, relevant terms that occur together. And so by extracting these topics and then detecting which of the messages contain which topics, we can um, tell the teacher how much um, coverage the different topics have among students. We can automatically suggest new ideas to students. We can group them and so on. Um, here's another example where we're experimenting with uh, ways of visualizing topics. On the left, you see the words um, extracted have been uh, clustered semantically. So Quebec, Montreal, Canada are all close together and they're far away from Mexico, Chile, Brazil. But it's still quite difficult to actually um, get a sense of what's going on because of all the overlap. So on the right, we have the same kind of visualization. But what we did is we tried to find a word that well describes a certain cluster. And the problem is that that word might never exist in the target text. If you have a list of five countries, the word country might not be among those words. However, there are online databases like ConceptNet where you have relationships such as Mexico is a country, Canada is a country, and so we can actually automatically determine that the best word to describe this cluster is country. Another strand of research is looking at collaborative writing. Because we have collaborative writing baked into Frog, as you saw during the demo, we are also able to get very fine-grained analytics about how the different students are contributing to the text and how the text is changing over time. And we are very interested in being able to automatically detect um, problems in collaboration, uh, different stages in the writing to tell the teacher whether students are soon finished or not, how the semantics are changing over time, and there's going to be a workshop in London in 10 days about uh, analysis of computer-supported collaborative writing. I showed you a bunch of uh, frog activities, which I think are uh, quite interesting. But of course, there's a lot of activities out there that are not part of frog. And we wouldn't want to have to remake the 120 physics simulations that FET provides or all of these other great tools that are out there. The problem, however, is that if we wanted to integrate these in Frog today, there aren't really uh, rich enough protocols for doing that. We could put an iframe, but it would be a black box that we have no control over. 
where we get no indication of whether the student is doing well or not. Uh, typically, the students would not be able to collaborate, and it's very limiting for us. So what we would really like is these rich embeddable activities that can be configured, um, ideally from within Frog, that are social, that support a collaboration, that can take data in from previous activities, that can produce data out to other activities, that provide streaming learning analytics so that we can monitor the learning as it happens, and ideally that also support orchestration so that the teacher can, uh, for example, pause the activity or intervene in different ways. And when I've been discussing this with other learning labs, I also realized that while Frog is great and we hope to see more uptake, it embodies some specific design ideas and pedagogical ideas that might not fit every single researcher. However, this general idea of rich embeddable activities is something that excites a lot of researchers. So while the full specification of this does not yet exist, what we're looking at is what can we already begin to do and how can we move the community forward? One thing that already exists and is growing in importance is uh, the Experience API, which is a standard for uh, interoperable learning analytics, live streaming of rich learning analytics across uh, systems. Uh, one of the systems that support XAPI is this H5P. Uh, these are rich widgets um, created by a Norwegian company, open source, increasingly used around the world. We were able to integrate H5P components in Frog, and because of this live streaming of learning analytics, we can do um, interesting stuff with that. So I'm going to give a quick demo of that. So in Frog, I can add a new activity, and I'll say that this is of type H5P, and I can upload a configured H5P activity here. So I'm going to use one that you might be familiar with because it's the classical H5P video from the front page of the h5p.org website. And now I can preview this and we see the video that we're familiar with. That because we have these streaming learning analytics, we can connect this activity into the frog learning graph. So what I actually want to do is to have a bit of an adaptive flow here. So I want to have two different activities. I'm going to have some students, they're going to look at a video. So we're going to add a video there. And then I'm going to have another group of students. They're going to watch a website. So I'm going to add an iframe. And now I need to indicate how this uh, distribution will happen. So I add a control operator. It's going to take the data from the H5P activity. We're going to select activity based on past performance. So students who get more than 60% on the quiz, we're going to hook it up here. And then we're going to say for low performance students, they're going to watch a video. And high performance students, they're going to look at the website. So we can start this session and we'll need two students. So here we have Peter and Anna I'm going to start the graph. And you see here the interactive video. So let's start the video and we'll go to the first quiz. Petter is struggling a bit with his understanding, so he thinks this is a blueberry. Anna is um, uh, correct in that this is a strawberry. And so we see here the scores. And right away, we can go back to the teacher interface, and we see here a live updated dashboard telling us um, data from these activities. I'm going to move to the next activity, which is this adaptive activity. And we see here that the two students are seeing different things based on their performance in the H5P activity. We're actually organizing a workshop in September in Leeds about XAPI and this idea of interoperability for learning analytics. If you're interested, please talk to me. And we're also looking at how we could possibly expose frog activities to other systems. Um, so this is GRASP. It's another platform uh, developed partially at EPFL, part of a big uh, EU project that's been ongoing for many years. And they have now added the ability to add frog apps to their interface. So they can choose which activity to add, they can configure it natively within that uh, system where they're already at, and the students can now watch a video, which doesn't look so impressive because adding a YouTube video is not very difficult, but because this is not just a YouTube video but a frog activity, the teacher now gets an interactive dashboard of how far the students have gotten in the videos. And so this is work that we're continuing to explore and we're very interested in discussing with other people who are developing these kind of activities, learning platforms, or thinking about possible ways of 
uh, making things more interoperable. Frog is open source. It's on GitHub and you should be able to get it running in about 10 minutes on your laptop if you're com comfortable with the terminal. It's not quite ready for prime time. However, we are using it in a number of lectures. We're planning a number of different experiments in the fall and we're very interested in talking to you about doing experiments. Um, we have a lot of interesting research opportunities around innovative activities, algorithms, visualizations. We'd like to have more settings where we experiment with frog graphs. So thank you again for inviting me and I look forward to your questions.